please get your song books turned to 551. <coughs> After we sing this song, Brother Tony believes in prayer before we start our Bible class. 551. Excuse me. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. We for the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, Jesus is merciful. Jesus will save, though they are sliding him, still he is waiting, waiting the penitent child to receive. Plead with them earnestly, plead with them gently, he will forget if they truly believe. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Rescue the perishing, duty demands it. Strength for thy labor the Lord will provide. Back to the narrow way, patiently win them. Tell the poor wanderer a Savior has died. Rescue the perishing. Care for the dying, Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Now with me please. Jesus says, Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the song we just sang about Jesus being merciful to us, Heavenly Father. We pray, dear God, that you'll watch over each one of us and help check our hearts, dear God, that, that we're doing your will and help us, Heavenly Father, to look at each other as brothers and sisters in Christ as we meet and uh, just be with us, Heavenly Father, as a family. And We pray, dear God, tonight to be with Brother Roger as he's preparing a lesson, that he'll have a ready recollection of what he's prepared. And we will also, dear God, study and search the scriptures, dear God, to find the truth. And keep it in our hearts. We're thankful, dear God, for all the times that we have together and the opportunity we have to come. And we pray, dear God, that you'll be with us and help strengthen us as a congregation. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. <coughs> Everybody got a copy of the, the lesson outline, I presume. I wanted to do something before we start tonight. You know, we have a lot of material just sitting around this building, and you know what happens to it? Nothing. And it's not going to teach itself. Even the Bible won't do that. So I had I put a couple of these in my car on Bible baptism, a study guide. And uh, I've had some spiritual conversations with my barber. So I was there yesterday. And before I left, I, I asked him, I said, have you ever done a real serious Bible study on the subject of baptism? He said, no. He said, I just remember when I was baptized and I handed him the book. I said, this covers about everything you need to know about it. Now, there's some more of them back there. Just like the orange one on the front wall on that table. So think about it. Your hairdresser, somebody you see regularly that you chit-chat with, think about it. And this is good material, right? He said, did you write it? I said, nope, some of my friends did. So anyway, I just want to share that with you. I don't, I'm, I'm supposed to go back here in about three weeks, and I'm going to ask him to be ready. Those lessons are very good. Yeah, and very thorough, aren't they? And biblical. All right, so tonight we're beginning, if you, if you have your uh, questions that Jesus asked handout, we got to uh, number 30. The baptism of John was from what source, from heaven or from men? Matthew 21 
and verse 25. And so I got to thinking about the question. And I was trying to figure out where this was in the time of Jesus' ministry and the conversation. And so this basically it digs a little deeper, as it were, than some. The texts that cover this, if you'll notice the top of your handout, are Matthew 21, 23, 27, Mark 11, 27, 33, and Luke 20, verses 1 through 8. If you go read those verses, they all read almost word for word the same way. Now, there are a couple of things that are different, but for the most part, they say the same thing. So I'm just following uh, Matthew's record for our study. Now... Let's read the text. Um, notice verse 21 of Matthew, 23 rather, Matthew 21. Now when he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him while he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one thing which if you tell me, I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John was from what source? From heaven or from men? And it's interesting how they responded to it. Um, and so they began reasoning among themselves. Verse 25 says, saying, if we say from heaven, he'll say to us, then why did you not believe him? But if we say from men, we fear the people, for they all regard John as a prophet. In answering Jesus, what did they say? We do not know. We do not know. He also said to them what? Neither do I tell you by what authority I do these things. Now, there's a lot more to this than meets the eye. The more I studied it, I got to digging a little deeper. So I wanted to back up, and I'm not going to read all these passages. They're in here for, uh, for your reading, but I do want to look at, let's look at uh, somebody, if you would, look up Isaiah 40 and verse 3, and who will read Matthew 3, 3? Raise your hand if you'll take Isaiah. Kathy Nichols. You, you got Matthew 3.3 3 when well, we get to it. I had Isaiah, but I'll Okay. Matthew. Fingers are faster on the phone than in a printed Bible. Matthew 3 and what? 3. three. Yeah. You ready? No, I want Isaiah 40, verse 3 first. A voice cry. Okay. Now, Steve. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. So you have the prophecy, and then you have the fulfillment. Matthew's record is filled with things like that. So John was a prophet and a forerunner of Jesus. Now look at Mac, uh, Malachi 4, four verses 5 and 6. Tony, would you get that? And Lynn, if you would get um, Matthew 11, 13 and 14. Malachi 4, 5 and 6. Yes. I got that right, didn't I? Yeah. You ready? Behold, I am going to send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Okay. Yeah. Uh, then Matthew 11, verses 13 and 14. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah, who, is, who, was, who was to come. 
So Isaiah prophesied of him. Matthew said John fulfilled it. Jeremiah, I mean Malachi rather, prophesied of him. Jesus said John fulfilled it. Now the reason I bring this up because Jesus was asked by the elders, uh, the chief priests and the elders, by what authority are you doing these things? Well, his question was, well, what about the baptism of John? Was it from heaven or from men? Let me ask you something. Why do you think he asked that particular question? Why did he choose that question? But why John? Why did he? That's a good answer. But why specifically did he ask him about John's baptism? Okay. As opposed to someone else's. Yeah. Because he was doing the baptizing. Okay, he was doing the baptizing. Let me help you out a little bit. Then, who was the first prophet to speak after Malachi? And how many years had it been? 400 years. What was John's primarily primary job? What did he come to do? Prepare the way for Jesus. So when John came preaching, should the elders or the, and the chief priest or the, have listened to John? Yeah. He fulfilled prophecy, didn't he? The text is clear, and they explained that he fulfilled prophecy. So, so I'm just laying a foundation for here for why Jesus talked about John's baptism. Jesus didn't say, why didn't you listen to me? He said, why didn't you listen to John? And where did his baptism come from? Was it authorized by heaven, or did John and, and some people just make this up? Well, there are only two options, right? There are only two options. Um, Lisa, look up. Have you read? She read. Who? Okay, Sister Sammy, you have not. My apology. Look up Mark 1 and verse 4 and Sammy Luke 3 and verse 3. John's baptism in purpose. Go ahead and read verse 5. And all the country of Judea was going out to him, and all the people of Jerusalem, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Okay, now, Luke 3, 3, Sammy. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Okay. Why did John baptize then? What was the purpose of his baptism? Okay. Had Jesus died yet? But he was going to. And so those bapt people baptized under John's baptism when Jesus died, would they have been forgiven? Yeah. Yes. Now, uh, Sister Linda, Acts 19 and verse 4. Put all this together now. John was prophesied to be the forerunner of Jesus, and he fulfilled that prophecy, right? His baptism was for the forgiveness of sins. John did not preach to Gentile people. He went into the wilderness. I read something today that was interesting, that some people who claimed to be especially holy lived in the wilderness. Although Jewish people anticipated a new exodus, through the wilderness, according to Isaiah 40 and verse 3, so many claim to be prophets or messiahs and gathered followings in wilderness areas. I think that's interesting. Somebody observed that. So that maybe helps you understand why he went in the wilderness to preach. Now, John's baptism was for the forgiveness of sins, but his preaching was to cause people to do what? 
to repent and to believe in Jesus. Now, I understand why Jesus asked them this question. They're asking Jesus about his authority. Well, listen, he said, now wait a minute. What about John? Was he a prophet of God or not? Was he or wasn't? He's asking them that, right? And, and you know what? They were caught between the horns of a dilemma. You know what they knew? They knew scripture. They knew the scripture. And if we look and and you remember what John said in Matthew three about them coming out there to be baptized, he called them what? A brood of vipers. Who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Because they thought, well, bunch of snakes you know they're, they're, they were hurtful and so that's an, that's an important point to, uh, to consider now Jesus authority by prophecy and fulfillment and how he was to be heard in all things these people knew the Pentateuch the first five books Matter of fact, they followed that closer than anything. That was the law. They believed in creation. They believed in the Exodus. They believed in Moses. I believe in Abraham before that. Believed in Moses. They believed in the law. Even though they corrupted it, they still believed it came from God. So what does the law say in Matthew 18, 15 to 18? We'll just start up here with Sister Nichols again. Uh, that's all right. And then, Steve, you be looking up Acts 3, 22 to 23, and Tony, you get Acts 7, 37. Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 18. Okay, that's where we're going to start. Yeah. Did I say Matthew? Yeah. Okay. Well, I meant Deuteronomy. Look at the paper and don't listen to me. Can't y'all read his mind? <laughs> can't you read my mind? I can't. <laughs> I went for a brain scan one time and it came up blank. All right. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen, just as you desire of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you say it. Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord, my God, or see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. Okay, now this is a prophecy about Jesus. How do we know? Um, Acts 3, 22 to 23. Is that yours, Tony? I got it. Oh, I'm sorry. I skipped you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet. Oh, wait a minute. I'm starting the wrong verse. Verse 22. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Now, ultimately, look at, read verse 26 while you're there. I know we're skipping some verses, but Peter was preaching and he's speaking to the Jewish people. So read verse 26 while you're still there. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his neighbors. So who did Peter say that fulfilled Deuteronomy chapter 18? Jesus, Jesus did. And they were to hear him in what? All things. All things. Now we got a problem. Well, the, the, the Jewish leaders did. They didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah. They didn't believe he was the Son of God. But he fulfilled the prophecies 
they should have believed John and they should have believed Jesus. Now, Acts 7, 37. This is the Moses who said to the sons of Israel, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Okay. Now, you got the full you got the prophecy and got the fulfillment. Now I realize if you all haven't already caught it that Acts three and Acts seven are after, long after this discussion Jesus had. But that doesn't change the truth of the statement, does it? So when Peter and the others went out to preach, they say, Look here, this is what Deuteronomy said. Look who fulfilled it. And who how what by what authority did Peter preach? From Jesus the Holy Spirit. That's right. Jesus had promised him and the other apostles in Matthew 16, 19, whatever you whatever has been bound on earth would have been whatever would be loosed on earth to be loosed in heaven, bound in heaven, be bound on earth. In other words, this is apostolic authority. So we got John's baptism, John's person verified, we've got his preaching verified, we've got Jesus verified, and many other prophecies that could be spoken. So now what were you going to say? I was just saying that their answer to Jesus, well, they're in that number, and that's, you know, they're reasoning well, if we, if, if we say it's of God, then you know, why do we believe in it? It, it looks like <coughs> they're reasoning, they're not really searching truth, they're looking for how to hold on to what they think. Well, and we'll get to that. They, but they, thank, it's that's almost right. like, like they don't want to hear the truth. All right. Now, I want to thank you for that. I want you to notice some events that had occurred right before this discussion. I want to just say, want, notice, the first thing we notice, if you go back to the first part of Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11, you have this triumphal entry into what city? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And, and so let's go look at it. And I, I want you to see now, things are, to use an old expression, things are coming to a head here. Let me just go ahead and tell you, this is the Passion Week. This is the week of Passover. Jesus is going to be crucified at the end of the week. This is, this is, so what's going on here, try to help, to help us understand, Jesus had basically reached the end of his ministry. Should they have known by then whether or not he was the Christ? Okay, so you see why he was saying, well, that's all i got to say. But notice with me, Matthew 21, 1 through 11, you've got this triumphal entry. When they had approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples. Somebody read for me. My voice is a little hoarse. Who will read verses 1 through uh, 6? Elisa said she'll do it. When they had approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, and Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, Go ahead and read verse 7, please. And brought the donkey and the colt, and laid their coats on them, and he sat on the coats. Now who will read verses 8 through 11? Kathy? Okay. She's fast. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before them and, and, and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. 
Notice this. Thank you for that. So notice you've got a prophecy fulfilled up in verse 5 from Isaiah 62. And, and you've got prophecy fulfilled in verse, uh, verse 9. If you look in your margin, it says Psalm 118 and verse 26. Prophecies are being fulfilled. It's important that we recognize that these are in the Gospel of Matthew written to the Jewish people. Now, you are a Jewish leader. You have position, you have power, and you probably have money. Okay? And all this time, you have rejected Jesus as being the Messiah. And it doesn't matter why, you just have. But what are these people doing? They're praising him. Yeah. How do you think that makes the Jewish leaders look? Makes them, makes them look bad, doesn't it? Now, now, so here's an event. There are plenty of other things, but here's an event that led up to, to them finally coming to him. Now, Jesus is in Jerusalem, and in chapter 12, verse 12 and following, Jesus enters what? I want to show you something. I'm going to jump ahead. Turn over to Matthew 24 and verse 1. Just take note of this. It's in your notes. But I wanted to share something with you. And my study time is paid off. Matthew 24, 1 says what, Linda? And Jesus went out and departed from the temple and went to the disciples' chamber for to show them the biblical teaching. All right, I'm going to show you, tell you something. So back here in Matthew 21 and, and verse 12, Jesus enters the temple. He does not leave until Matthew 24 and verse 1. Everything that transpired between there and Matthew 24, 1 was in the temple. Now, that's very critical to understand. And so, uh, so notice here in our, in our notes here, it's critical to note that, that this was at the end of Jesus' Judean ministry. It's the final week of, before his crucifixion. He had taught and had several discussions and disputes with the Jewish leaders throughout his ministry, a lot of times in the temple. Now, in verses 12 through 17, we have the cleansing of the temple. This is the second cleansing. There was a not first one in the Gospel of John. And what did he do? What did he do when he went into that temple, Lynn? What did he do when he went in there, Sammy? What did he do in when he first went in? Yeah, here in chapter twenty-one, verses twelve and following. What did he do when he went in there? Uh, he was angry with them. Yeah, they were in there buying and selling and making money. And what did he tell them in verse thirteen, Sammy? I want you all to follow me. Follow this with me. Whose house do you think he was claiming that to be? God's. To them. God's house. But who cleansed that temple? You think that might have upset the Jewish leaders? They've been letting that stuff go on. I don't know the whole history of all. There are people that are wise, have more knowledge and experience and all the ins and outs of how those things... But the Jewish leaders allowed that to go on, didn't they? Jesus wouldn't. And they could have taken that as an, an indirect onslaught. You're telling us we're letting something go on that shouldn't be, and you're running people out of here, and you're making it a doc, doc, robber's den. Okay? That's a condemnation. And I'll tell you something else, too. Jesus is fed up with their ways. You know what righteous indignation is versus just, did you ever get angry and, and spank your child maybe a little quicker than you should have? Yeah, anger kind of took over instead of thinking it through. God doesn't work that way. Jesus had righteous indignation because what was, and at that time, was the temple still a valid place of worship? Jesus hadn't died yet. And so he goes in there and he cleans it, cleans it out. I want you to notice, 
Oh, look what the crowds are saying about him. Look what he did in that temple. What in the, who in the world does this guy think he is? And, and so I want to read verse 15. Whose turn is it to read? Is it your turn, Lynn? Read Matthew eleven fifteen. I'm sorry, I'm 21.15. I'm just, it's Wednesday. Give me a little slack here. 21.15. But when the chief priest and scribes saw the wonderful things that he had done, and the children who were shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they became indignant. What's a synonym for being indignant? Give me a synonym. Mad. Angry, irate, very disturbed and upset. And in spite of the wonderful things that he did, because we see in, in verse 14, a blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. Look at the good Jesus did. They couldn't see it because of their jealousy. Well, it said they did see it. But I mean, they couldn't appreciate it. They couldn't appreciate it. And so, see, all this is building up before this question is asked. And so, so, so notice, notice number six here. The chief priests and the elders and their reaction and reply, they began doing what among themselves? Reasoning. The text says they were reasoning among themselves. What are we going to do about this question? We're, we're caught here. There are only one or two answers. And we can't say that it was from men because the people all considered John what? And he was. The text of the Old Testament and the preaching of John proved and the preaching of Jesus. Jesus approved of John's preaching long before this. Blind people cannot see the truth because they don't want to. Isn't that sad? I was talking with Brother Mike and I, Hicks and I did an interview with a brother from Haiti today. He was in our class from Jamaica. And we're trying to get some classes going, international classes for these international churches to help them start working on getting elders. And Brother Maxime says, a lot of them don't want elders. And I, I plainly said, that's sinful. It's one thing not to have the people, but not to have the desire or a plan to work on it, or you don't want them because you're going to lose your position of authority. Is that sinful or not? It's absolutely sinful. But you see, what's the difference and I, 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 it's on, I recorded it. It's not publicly available. But what's the difference in that attitude and the attitude of these Jewish leaders? None, except these preachers probably wouldn't kill Jesus. But still, and I told Brother Maxime, I said, you know, I preach to people all the time that won't listen. And I'll tell you how I know, by their fruit by how they respond. But I'm not responsible for what other people believe. I'm responsible for what I st study and teach. I'm not, I can't, and, and Jesus was not responsible for them, but what he said was the truth. And so the burden was on them to weigh it all out. We don't know. Liars. They did know, didn't they? Yes. Isn't it amazing? You ever had a Bible study with somebody and you just be as plain as the nose on your face and they say, I don't believe that. Well, maybe they don't. Well, I can't see that. There's a difference in can't see that and doesn't want to see that. There's a huge difference. Now, we do not know. Was that a genuine and honest answer? 
the Lord, they knew from John's preaching and admitted to what the Lord could have possibly asked them. They're the ones that said, well, he's going to ask us this. They weren't, they weren't unintelligent. They weren't dumb. But they weren't honest either. They knew what the people believed about John. And Jesus questioned John's baptism. Was it divinely ordained? Did it come from God when it says from heaven? Or did it come from human beings? Did it come from men? There are only two choices. And the Lord didn't ask them. I want you to turn over to top page four. The Lord did not ask them what the people believed. But why did you not believe him? He kept the conversation with them. Why did you not believe him? Isn't that something? Now they didn't address that one. But they lied when they said we don't know. Now, look at the Lord's final reply there. Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Now, I broke this down. I want you to notice something with me. I've got the text here so you don't have to flip to it. But ample evidence had been given to them over and over and over and over during Jesus' ministry. When he was in Gethsemane, he made the statement, this is while he's being arrested. Uh, whose turn is it to read? Just read that Luke twenty-two fifty-three right here off your page if you got it. Is it your turn, Linda? Will somebody else read it? 22, yes, Luke Okay, how often was he in the temple? That doesn't mean every single day, but he was in the temple regularly, wasn't he? It's not his first time in the temple. It's not the first time him go in there and teach. Now, it was acceptable for a rabbi to go into the temple and preach. That wasn't really the problem. The problem is the average rabbi would not have said what Jesus did because they weren't him. His teaching was very different, wasn't it? And so, in Luke twenty-two fifty-three, 53, this has reached a climax where he's being arrested. And so, it's called this hour and power of darkness. And even though it was the will of God that Jesus died, it was still an hour of power and darkness. Now, Jesus knew that these men were not genuinely interested in him answering their question. He, they were looking for a reason to kill him for blasphemy. Somebody who's, I'm going to let you all read to see this. So do we come back to, whose turn is it? your turn, Steve? Maybe? Um, Matthew 10, 31. I'm sorry, Jen, yeah, it's Wednesday. Give me some slack here. John 10, 31. It's on your paper there on page 4. Uh, and Matthew 26, 65. Is it your turn, Tony? All right, you read Matthew 26, 65. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. <laughs> Well, maybe I, is it, what is the next verse? What does the verse before that say? Maybe I need to correct this paper. I and my father are one. Okay. And then the Jews pick it. Verse 32 said he showed them many good works. Okay. Which of these good works these works is stone? Yeah. All right. Can you go for Yes, sir. Can you say later about the Bible says that Jesus knew those things you mentioned and the frustration that they had, it was 
It was actually Pilate, but that statement is correct. Even a Gentile governor recognized what was going on, didn't he? Now, John 10, I want to look at that, because I may have to correct this paper, but I want to make sure. Uh... Okay, okay, I do need to make a correction here. Steve, please read again. Read verses 31 through 33, and I'm going to correct this, because I knew I'd left something out. John chapter 10. Please, yeah. Thirty-one to thirty-three. All right. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, "Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works did he stone him?" The Jews answering him, saying, "For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because of thou being a man, makest thyself God." There you go. So why did they try to kill him? For claiming to be someone that they thought he was not. We know the truth on it. And they should have known it. Now, that's early on. Then in Matthew 26, 65, during his trial. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He hath blessed me. What further need do we have of witnesses? Behold, you have now heard the blasphemy. So... What did Caiaphas do from that point on? What, what did he do? He ultimately got him into the hands of Pontius Pilate and had him killed. Now, Jesus knew what was going to happen. He knew, but, but you see, all this has been building up. If you go back, and I don't remember where I, if you go down to the bottom of page four there, you remember Herod tried to get Jesus killed when he was born. The Jews were after him from the time of his birth. So it's, it's amazing to me. I wish I had a, had a tunnel or some secret way of getting into their minds to see why they believed what they did. But nonetheless, now, I want you, here's my point I was bringing up when we started. There, let her see. Jesus did remain in the temple, even though he said, I'm not going to tell you why. But he didn't stop teaching. He kept on teaching. And he, he spent verses 28 through the end of chapter 23. And that scathing, powerful sermon he preached against the, the hypocrisy of the scribes and the Pharisees in Matthew 23. But he did that because he wanted them to see themselves. It's sad that they couldn't. And so Matthew 24, 1, we learn that he leaves the temple. And so uh, it's, just, it's just interesting that in the middle of this, so somebody said this discussion, I didn't have to research it, so don't hold this as fact, but somebody said this discussion took place on Tuesday of the Passover week. So he's crucified on Friday. And all this stuff's leading up to it. He had time to explain the Lord's Supper to his disciples and talk to them about some things. He, he, he went into Gethsemane and he took the disciples with him. And then from that point on, he was arrested and ultimately crucified. Now, let's look at some observations here. As noted earlier, John was sent to all the people of God, Israel, at that time, to prepare them for the Messiah. So, the, And that's unquestionably true. Number two, Jesus had full authority from heaven for his actions. Notice John 2. You know what happened in John 2? The wedding feast in Cana of Galilee. And so his Galilean ministry began there. What we have here in, in John Matthew 21 is the Judean ministry where he's getting closer and closer to Jerusalem, or he's actually in Jerusalem. Uh, whose turn is it to read? It's your turn, Lynn. All right. Just looking at the paper here at uh, 
2A on the bottom of page 4 there. Note John 4. What, is, what does the text say about verse 11? This beginning of the sign as Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Manifested his glory. That's one of the purposes of the Lord's miracles. To manifest the glory of God. And what was the result? Many believed. Many believed. And I want to, so, so the triumphal entry had been prophesied in Isaiah 62, 11 and Jeremiah 9, 9. And so this, what happens in, as he comes into Jerusalem, that was prophesied. And we noted that when we read the text, the cleansing of the temple was done because it was his father's house. You remember when Jesus got lost from his parents and they they, don't, they were headed home and they, they couldn't find him to go back. Now, where did they find him? And what did he say to, to, to his mother? My father's business or my father's house. At age 12, Jesus said, This house belongs to my heavenly father. Whose house was it when he was preaching all those times daily in the temple and in Jerusalem? He was a son of God. You know what's wrong with people? The Hebrews writer said it. They're dull of hearing. And their hearts are hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And so if you, if you just keep reading, I want to share. I know we're over time, but I don't really want to come back to this. I want to, if it's all right with you. You can read the rest of it. But I want you to notice here on the bottom of page 5, what King David, his disposition toward the Word of God. And since we're getting close to being out of time, I'll read it. Psalm 119, verses 57 through 64. David said, The Lord is my portion. I have promised to keep your words. I sought favor with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your word. I, I considered my ways and turned my feet to your testimonies. I hastened and did not delay to keep your commandments. The cords of the wicked have encircled me, but I have not forgotten your law. At midnight I shall rise to give thanks to you because of your righteous ordinances. I'm a companion of all those who fear you and all those who keep your precepts. Those were his friends. The earth is full of your loving kindness, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. Now, did the Jewish people sort of revere David? What was David's attitude toward the will of God? You know, if a person gets skewed early, what I mean by that? That's not the Messiah. He can't be him. He wouldn't come in. He wouldn't be raised in Nazareth. Can any good come out of Nazareth? Look at that poor people. This is supposed to be a king. We had to bring presents to him. He hadn't given any presents to anybody. He's not shown, well, because they misunderstood him from the get-go. It's important how you approach something as to where you'll end up. And so common people, though, heard Jesus gladly, didn't they? And so uh, number eight says, people who are looking for the truth today will be like David Bold and the disciples of Jesus' day. You remember what Peter said in John 6, 68, 69? To whom shall we go? I'm on the last bottom page six. To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Listen, if a common, basically blue-collar, probably not very educated, Galilean fishermen can figure that out, these Jewish leaders could have to too. They had the scriptures. They read them all the time. So just so now I'll kind of help you put that in its context and our next question is uh, Matthew 21, 28. What do you think? Same chapter. 
Anyway, thank you all for your help. Yes, sir. They didn't have to, did they? They didn't have to. Jesus would would not give them any slack. All right. What's the invitation song number? Fifty. Fifty. What's the title? I think I heard that earlier this evening. One of my favorite singing groups, probably from the seventies, was uh, Longins and Messina, and I was kind of winding things up today put his LP album on and they got this song called Peace of Mind it's a really pretty song I got thinking what's real peace of mind it's not being off on some desert island drinking booze and having no worries in the world Jesus told his disciples after he told them in John 14 1 and following do not let your hearts be troubled Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions or abiding places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and where I go, I come again, and I will receive you to myself, and there you will be also. They were worried. They, Jesus had been talking about leaving. They were concerned about it. Don't, don't, don't let your hearts be troubled. If you move a little further over into the chapter, verse 27, Jesus says, peace I leave with you, not as the world gives do I give, to give it to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. The peace that Jesus offers, I promise, promise you, is better than what Loggins and Messina had in mind. Everybody likes a good vacation. But the peace, peace he's talking about here is a home in heaven. Don't worry about it. I'm going to die. I'll be back. I'll be resurrected. And then he left again and he, he promised, I'm coming back again. Now that's peace for the child of God. It, he's coming back for us. If that doesn't make you feel good, a lot of people don't believe that, but I do and you do. It's a wonderful, that. now that's peace of mind or peace of heart it, it really is John, uh, Jesus promised he says not like the world's peace you know the world say yeah you just need to take a couple of days off go spend some money go buy something you like you know that's okay once in a while but does that really bring us everlasting peace no just short lived but we can live and die with the peace that Jesus offers. And that's wonderful. You know, if if one of you were to pass away and I were still here and I did your funeral, I don't preach your funeral. Uh, a friend of mine's doing a, a funeral for a very well-known brother. He was an elder in the Gatewell Church that published Spiritual Sword, passed away the other day. And Mike Hickson's going to do his funeral on Friday, but Brother Wallace already preached his own funeral. But people who die with the Lord die in peace. R.I.P., rest in peace, really only applies to the faithful child of God. But it can apply to us. And Jesus said, I'm giving something to you. And the world can't give it to you. Only Jesus could. There may be someone watching online tonight. Maybe it's the first time you've watched us. I don't know. Maybe you've watched us a lot. How do you get peace from Jesus? you got to believe he's God's son. He told the Jews in John 8, 24, unless you believe that I am he, you'll die in your sins. He told them that twice. He didn't want them to, but it was critical that they believed he was the son of God. He was deity. 
Jesus himself said, unless you repent, you'll all in like manner perish in Luke 13 and verse 3. In Matthew 10, 32 and 33, he says, if you'll confess me before men, you know what that confession says? I believe in Jesus, the Son of God, and I live for him. It's not just talk. I'll confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you deny me, if you're just talking or you don't even admit it, I'll deny you before my Father. And then Jesus finally said in Luke, you know, Mark 16, 15, and 16, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every single person, every creature. He who has believed and has been baptized will be saved. When a person believes and is baptized based upon their repentance and their confession, what happens? Forgiveness. Sweetest word in the whole Bible. Forgiveness. I pray to tell you what, that's peace. And then to be baptized, to have their sins washed away like Saul of Tarsus was told in Acts 22, 16. And like the eunuch in Acts 8, after Philip immersed him, he went on his way in peace. He was rejoicing. He was happy. Let's do what Jesus said. Now I have to ask, are you at peace with the Lord tonight? Genuine peace with you. You need the prayers of your brethren for anything. If you're watching online and you need any help with what I talked about, please reach out to us. The invitation is yours as we stand and as we sing. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood?